So welcome all to this webinar. Uh, this is a really special event for all of us at the Gordon Institute at Tufts University. Uh, we have on the call here everyone from prospective students at Tufts, current students at Tufts, recent alumni of Tufts, and then Tufts alumni. And so with that full spectrum, we're really, really happy to bring you this panel because I think for each and every one of you, we hope that there's a piece of advice or a piece of insight that you can pick up. Uh, we're fortunate here today that uh, we have three panelists who Sarah will go ahead and uh, introduce who are alumni of the uh, Gordon Institute. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the Gordon Institute is actually the locus for all the professional education in leadership, management, and entrepreneurship at Tufts University with over 200 graduate students a year and over 500 undergraduates a year taking classes and programs in entrepreneurship, management, and leadership. And so we look forward to inspiring a whole new generation of what we call transformative leaders with heart. Because in the world that we're living in today, where technology touches everything, where we have people in machine learning, we have genetic modification, every aspect of everyday life and every individual is touched by technology, creating a demand for a new kind of leader, a technical leader who can see the world with fresh eyes, who can see the creative new solutions, and who, with heart, can work and focus on ways of improving the world with deep empathy for people and for deep empathy for society. I think you'll find today that Carl, Lisa, and Sean are great examples of what I think are transformative leaders with heart, and we hope that you'll be inspired uh, by the stories they tell you today. So Sarah, would you like to introduce them? Sarah Stockwell sure. is on our faculty here at the Gordon Institute, and uh, I welcome Sarah to take it away. Thank you, Kevin. Welcome, everybody. I want to add my welcome to all of our panelists, as well as all of our attendees near and far. We're just so pleased to have you join us today. Special welcome to our panelists, Lisa, Carl, and Sean. We're really thrilled to have you here. And since your bios were listed in great detail on our website, we're going to have you do a quick introduction, each of you, because we're really going to spend some time today talking about how you can advance your career in tech. So to get us started with your quick intro, I'd love to ask you each for just a brief one minute introduction. Um, in particular, we wanna know who you are, what you do, and then if you're willing to share a quick fun fact about yourself, we'd love to hear that too. And Lisa, I'd like to ask you to start us off. Sure, it's great to be here virtually with everyone this evening. Um, my name is Lisa Wyman. I work at Acceleron Pharma and I have responsibility for drug development, manufacturing, supply chain, and quality. I'm a senior vice president there. And um, a fun fact about myself is today, I am celebrating my nine year wedding, wedding anniversary with my husband. So uh, we, we really know how to celebrate. <laughs> what a way to celebrate it with us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Carl, we'd like to get to know you. Thank you and, uh, and good evening all. Uh, it's it's a, a joy to be here. And uh, so my name is Carl Long. I, am, uh, I have a bachelor's in chemical engineering work for Cabot Corporation, which is the specialty chemical company, not the cheese company and not the stain company. Um, <laughs> let's just make sure we're clear on that. Um, I, I work in manufacturing and operations where I've spent just about my entire career. And my focus is on quality and continuous improvement, which includes the deployment of lean principles and uh, lean concepts uh, around all of our uh, manufacturing operations around the world. Um, I've been happily married for 21 years and um, Anyone who knows me and knows uh, my wife knows that she is definitely the better half. And uh, I'm also the proud father of two sons, ages 10 and 12, um, who are doing their best to keep me young. I grew up in Northeast Wisconsin in a small city called Appleton, uh, which is near to Green Bay. So I'm still a Green Bay Packer fan. Thanks, Carl. Okay, Sean, we'd love to hear from you. Sure, uh, and good evening, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you're calling in from. Uh, I'm Sean Hemingway. Uh, I'm a career uh, biopharmaceutical professional. Uh, I've been in the industry for a couple of decades now. Um, my role today, I'm the, the leader of an organization we call BioLife Plasma Services, uh, which is part of Takeda. Uh, I run a plasma collection business um, in the United States and in, and in Europe. I've um, been in the industry for a while. I came in as an engineer uh, and I had a career path that took me through a number of different areas, but ultimately I've been always really drawn to healthcare. Uh, I think the opportunity we have to make a difference in, in, in human health and in public health is a really noble pursuit. And I, I've always had 
you know, an opportunity to understand that I have the ability to impact people in that way. And it's, to me, it's really motivating. So I've been very fortunate in that sense. Uh, I learned something new about Carl there just a minute ago. Um, Carl, I have uh, five collection centers in and around Appleton, Wisconsin. I've also got a learning center there. Uh, so we have a, a new thing to talk about later. Absolutely. Uh, I, uh, maybe my fun fact, I turned 50 this week, uh, which um, went by pretty quick. Uh, probably as quick as I got there, it went by. So uh, I'm now over 50, which I never thought I'd find myself there, but there you go. Um, uh, married, uh, I have three kids, uh, all pretty small, six, four and, and one and a half. And, uh, and they keep me busy when I'm, not, uh, when I'm not on the job. Thank you all. It's great to hear a little bit about each of you. So now in order to get us rolling here tonight to talk a little bit more about how to advance your career in tech, uh, we'd love to hear from each of you a little bit more about your own personal career journey. So maybe some, an opportunity you've seized, a challenge you faced, a lesson you've learned, anything else that feels like it's a compelling aspect that you'd love to share with our audience today. Uh, and Carl, I'd love to ask you uh, to go first, please. Certainly. So uh, as I thought about, you know, kind of what I would want to share about my career journey, which is actually, you know, began with, I didn't have any idea of how it would unfold. I think at the time, um, everything looked interesting. Um, at the time, I was an engineer, just an individual contributor, and didn't quite uh, realize what the opportunities out there might be. But the one that I really want to talk a bit about is uh, when I had the opportunity to be the plant manager for one of the Cabot sites. Um, and, and that role was both complex and also a, it was a very challenging role because it, I still had a lot of growth to, to go through myself as a leader. Um, and it's a role in which, and for anyone who, who's ever, you know, run a plant or been, been a, the lead of a, of a facility like that, um, the buck stops with you. It all stops at your desk. And, and there are so many different things going on. You have to figure out what's important and what's not. And, and you know, this is something that uh, I think I'll come back to uh, later on in our conversation tonight. But, you know, it's, it's also uh, an important role because you get to shape the path. So, you have uh, influence and ability to uh, make things better and to you know, kind of make your mark. And, and that's also, I think, quite empowering. Um, but I will also say that it was one of the loneliest roles I ever had. Um, and, and, uh, and, there are, and there are two particular instances that um, really accentuate this. Um, the first, it was on May 30th of 20, 2008. I remember it quite vividly because it was, uh, if anyone remembers and thinks back to what was going on in 2008, um, the economy had cratered um, and we actually had to do a reduction in force. And it was the first time I'd ever been through anything like that. And you know what you're doing is gonna impact negatively on people. And, um, and it's, it's a terrible uh, position to be in, but there's a whole other set of folks that are counting on you to, to be a good leader and to do the right thing, to save the company, to, to make sure that, that we can stay in business. I mean, so uh, you, you have to go through that. But, um, you know, I, I, vague, I very, very vividly remember after it was all done, um, going into the office and telling everyone it's done, it's over. Uh, so they don't worry about the, when's the next shoe coming to drop. Um, another uh, instance I'll quickly share was um, in the same year, in August the 25th. And again, this one is seared into my memory because um, it was an early Monday morning, you know, after a weekend, and I got the phone call at 2 a.m saying that uh, someone was hurt and that uh, this person was still trapped in the equipment. So I immediately hustled, got into my car, um, you know, and, and went to the plant and where I found a team that was shell-shocked. The entire plant team uh, was, was just beside themselves and, and pale. And uh, so we, we immediately had to work on that and, and, and make sure that the individual was well taken care of. But then, you know, mustered the resolve to figure out what exactly had happened and how we could prevent it from ever happening again. So um, these are the sorts of things that I encountered uh, in that role. Um, and I would say that um, much of, of what I encountered as a, as a plant manager, um, I, I didn't realize it at the time when I was going through TGI, but a lot of it was extremely relevant. The, the training and the, and the things that I learned, I applied directly in this role in any, in any number of ways and not even just things that, that maybe would be immediately obvious, such as um, you know, operations or, or uh, um, statistics and things like this, but you know, some of the human element, some of new product development, uh, software design, finance, all of these things came into play um, as a plant manager. So 
um, I really, uh, I think I wouldn't have been as good of a plant manager if I hadn't gone to TGI, that's for sure. Thank you, Carl, for sharing those really very real life examples that you have to face as a manager and also for helping us understand how your time at, at TGI helped you. Uh, Lisa, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your personal career journey uh, with, to share with our crowd. Sure. Um, when I was thinking about this question, I did a lot of reflection. So when I think about kind of where I started and where I am today, I feel like what stands out as a theme is that um, over the last 20 years, I really stepped in or stepped up or stepped across in many different roles. And I can honestly say that my skill set is probably broader than many of my peers. And um, I feel like this is a differentiator that I have as a professional in the life sciences industry, um, kind of being brave enough to really step into different roles, whether it was a lateral assignment, um, moving into a new organization within a global company, or you know, making a tough decision to kind of leave an organization because I, I really wasn't um, being challenged or that passion wasn't there. And so from that experience, I've been able to um, work with different teams. I've been able to kind of observe different leadership styles. And I was thinking, you know, like what made me um, really want to kind of broaden or diversify my skills or my experience, um, which I feel strongly that has, it really has positioned me better for broader roles because I've kind of been there and done many things and work with different teams. And my advice to you is kind of think about your career path as kind of a jungle gym and not a ladder. Because if you view your career path as a ladder and kind of set out this well-defined plan um, or a routine, you're gonna miss out on some big opportunities. And I, um, I'm personally a creature of habit. So when I think about like some of the career moves or choices I made, I don't know how I did it. Um, but, you know, I think what has helped me is I kind of have always thought of what my long term dream or vision was. Um, and it was to be a leader, um, you know, at the executive level in a life sciences company. I'm passionate about science, technology. I started out in an engineering role, but I love to work with teams. I love to mentor and coach staff. And then I like to make business decisions. And so I've kind of set my career path. Um, with, within like 18 month chunks. So I'm very specific um, within that 18 month time period, you know, like what am I gonna learn? How am I gonna grow? And how am I gonna improve as a leader? But not losing sight of that vision or dream to be that, um, you know, top level leader in an organization. And so, you know, kind of three points to take away from my personal career journey are um, take risks, choose growth, and never lose your passion. Um, once you feel like you're getting complacent or you don't have that fire in your belly, it's time to move on. Um, and just don't be afraid. Um, you know, you ask yourself like, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And that's how I, I've navigated my career over the last 20 years. Thank you, Lisa, for those really actionable points that we can all consider and think about. Sean, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your personal career journey. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share a couple points. Um, yeah, I mean, some, some common experiences across the three of us, I think, right, you know, in terms of things not necessarily being overly linear. Um, but, you know, as I, I, was, I was thinking about this, and it's actually an example I'll bring in that's very real time. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, one of the most important things for me from a career point of view happened 23 years ago, um, you know, back in the, in the second half of the 90s. Uh, I was still in the engineering discipline, um, loved what I was doing, um, was pretty good at it. Uh, and I had an opportunity to give uh, an, an update on a project that I was responsible for at a company town hall. Um, and I, mean, I was the project manager. You couldn't ask me a question that I didn't have the answer to off the top of my head. Like I, I knew the job, um, every aspect of it. And so I was, you know, grateful to have the opportunity to, uh, you know, to give 10 minutes on the project to, um, to the company. And it was a complete um, car crash. I mean, it was absolutely a horror show um, from start to finish. And uh, when I finished, we were still using transparencies at the time. And I talked at the projector and I looked <laughs> away from people and it was bad. And uh, when I finished, a friend of mine uh, walked by me and he clapped me on the shoulder and he said, it happens to everybody once. 
And, and he was right. Um, and it happened to me once. And that was for me a, a really important sort of learning opportunity in that I didn't know, I didn't know how to do that. You know, I wasn't ready for it. I hadn't prepared for it. I hadn't asked anybody for any guidance. Uh, but it was pretty apparent to me that that was something I was going to have to get a whole lot better at than I was. And it was the first time after undergraduate school where I realized that while I was learning a lot every day at work, um, I wasn't learning everything. And that was actually one of the sort of seminal moments for me that drove me to go back to school um, to get, you know, to, 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 to train, to learn, um, to really focus on some things that I thought I could do faster via an educational route than I could just doing it on my own or at, or at, at work. I think a second example I'll call out, um, you know, I was, I had the opportunity to take a job in Ireland uh, when I was 31 and I was super, it was a great role. I was very excited about it, but it was orders of magnitude bigger than anything I had been, you know, responsible for before. You know, I went from running small capital projects, you know, five, 10, $15 million kind of stuff to, you know, being responsible for a, pretty monstrous effort, several hundred million dollars, you know, several hundred people who were, you know, ultimately under my responsibility. And uh, I was into the, I, like, I knew what I was doing, but it was a bigger job. And I was into the job, you know, for a few months and I had an opportunity to have sort of a sit down with um, a guy who was on the project team uh, who had a considerable amount of experience. And he just offered me a point of view about, you know, what I, how I was running the job, how I was, how I was sort of managing the job. And in essence, what he told me is you're managing this job the way you've managed every other job. And you're never going to make it if you do that. Like you, you've got to get up on top of it instead of being in it. He's like, you know, every detail about this job, you know, everything that's going on. And that's not your job. Your job is to lead this. And, and my takeaway from that was twofold. One, I needed to get up out of the details a little bit. Um, but two, that was one of the first, you know, sort of real realizations for me was that I should seek feedback from people that I work with. You know, there are a, a lot of people um, that you work with every day, irrespective of their job, whether they're more senior or peer or, you know, elsewhere in the organization, there's an enormous amount of insight um, that people have and are, are very happy and willing to share. And I think the, you know, sort of the third thing that I'll mention, you know, is a, sort of an ongoing lesson today. I'm, you know, I'm responsible for 7,000 people you know, um, across the United States and, and Europe. And we're living in the middle of a pandemic and managing and leading um, folks through what's going on right now is not easy. Um, and we're also, you know, living through some pretty difficult times just from a social justice point of view. You know, there are a lot of issues with race and racism that are really important for us to be dealing with and not in a conceptual way. Um, an employee is only an employee when they come through the door. You know, they're a person who live in a community outside of that. And it's not possible to just leave all that in the parking lot. You know, so, you know, leading with empathy and really being mindful of a person's experience, sort of the whole person that's coming into the job every day is really critical. And, you know, being able to, you know, be mindful of that in whatever role you're in is really important. Companies are just groups of people with a common purpose. And it's really important to pay attention to the whole person and not just the employee. So I think those are probably three, you know, big takeaways for me, you know, over the course of my career so far. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean, for your vulnerability and auth authenticity around um, what we're dealing with right now. And that's actually a segue into our next section. I'll explain briefly how this is going to work. We're going to do a bit of a moderated discussion where I'll direct a specific question to each of you. Uh, and then after you've had a chance to have a few minutes to answer that question, I'll open it up to the other panelists. So if other of you on the call, the panel would like to answer as well, then I'll, I'll certainly tap you to that. So uh, Carl, like I said, transitioning from what Sean said, I'm gonna start with you and um, build on what Sean said and say, you know, we've been through a lot since March when the pandemic hit. And I'm wondering if you can tell us more about how you and your company are managing through these times. I'd love to hear specific skill sets that have been the most critical um, in order for you to be effective and some examples of how you've applied them to lead through this time of great challenge and uncertainty. Yeah, certainly. And um, I think Sean stated it well that we are in a, a very challenging time. Um, 
you know, we not only are we dealing with the, the pandemic and, and really the human level and, and wellness and employees uh, staying healthy, but then we've got the, elect, the um, economic collateral that has, uh, the damage has been done thereafter. And, and that is also posing a whole new set of challenges. Um, so at Cabot, you know, we've really been focused first on, on, on employee safety and, in, and making sure that uh, we are doing things uh, in accordance with uh, the guidelines. And then even further than that, we have, I'd say, a long tradition of focusing on, uh, on deep commitment to safety. And so we are taking that, those sorts of approaches of thinking through hazards and layers of protection, and we're applying it to our response uh, to COVID. And I'd say, you know, in addition to the, the stuff that, that, you know, most people are doing with respect to distancing and, and helping to limit spread, um, we also have established, I think, very clear expectations of how we want everyone to do their part to adhere to practices that will help prevent the spread. And so really, I think, leaning on, um, you know, some of the company's core values of how we want to behave, um, even from a safety standpoint, and applying it um, directly uh, with respect to, to COVID and, and how we're going to try to keep our operations open, but in a way that doesn't expose people to, to risk uh, and, and something that we wouldn't want to see. Um, and the other thing that we've done is, from an economic point of view, really thinking about um, how we can serve cash and keep, our, and keep liquidity in the company. Um, it's important in times like this to make sure that you can fund your operations. And so a lot of our focus has been on you know, figuring out what's really needed and, and then trimming back in areas where, where we think we can and being judicious in our spending so that we're not, um, you know, so not going to impair the business. Um, but at the same time, we also are trying to make sure that we're positioning ourselves to be ready to win when, when things do turn around. We can't cripple ourselves so much that we aren't able to, uh, to really um, to succeed and, and execute on our strategy um, when things do uh, come around. And I think this is where I would actually um, probably share is, you know, this is a, a moment of abrupt change. And it's, it's actually an, a moment where we've, we've, as leaders, the key is, is not about what happens to you, it's about what you res how you res respond. And um, we need to embrace that change and, and oftentimes help others through it. Um, change can be quite difficult. And so you've got to obviously lead yourself and, and help, you know, kind of, it'd be easy to fall prey to uh, just how much has been lost and, and how much of a tough situation we're in. But um, people who are in leadership, we're, we are there to help others, um, you know, reach for a better, a better um, uh, opportunity and to figure out how do we um, thrive despite what's going on around us. Um, so one of the things that I do in my normal everyday job is, is uh, promote our continuous improvement efforts, which um, has largely been disrupted because we can't travel. A lot of what we do requires you to be present and to see things with the naked eye directly in order to influence. You know, a lot of these changes come uh, through influence and, and drawing input from, from those who are closest uh, to, the, to the work or to the process. Um, so it would have been easy to say, oh, well, that's all off the table. We can't do it any longer. But I quickly determined that we needed to pivot. If, if there's no other time for us to actually be trying to drive cost savings, now is it. And so um, what I did is figure out how do we still perform this same action, but in a way leveraging um, kind of a more semi-remote structure and quickly designing and figuring out how to do that and still uh, essentially affect change has been uh, something that I think has, has really helped us. And um, it's also, I think, given us um, a bit of energy because we feel like, yeah, we're still in control of our destiny. Um, and, and, and it means that, that we can still deliver on, on some of the cost savings that we had planned. And so I think to be successful, we need to be comfortable with change and we need to embrace that uncertainty and, and, and be improv improvisational um, at times as well. Thank you, Carl, for sharing what, what your organization is doing during these times. Um, Lisa or Sean, do either of you have something you'd like to add around this question? Sure, so I, um, I work at a mid-sized biotech company and the majority of my staff are you know, lab-based or manufacturing-based. So um, the company actually sent all employees home at one point um, in the middle of March. And so there was a significant amount of uncertainty within um, my employee base because like their passion, um, their work and their priorities are all in the lab. So um, you know, we didn't have 
an optimal workload that we could just transition from the office to the home. And so, you know, I felt like in addition to people navigating this new normal um, in a pandemic, I had, you know, 75 plus lab-based employees who are also navigating a new sense of work. And so as Carl mentioned, you know, kind of change, acknowledging change um, and kind of getting that people through that change, I think was a significant challenge for me as a leader as well um, as my people leaders. So things that I think that we did extremely well was, um, you know, finding ways to um, openly communicate and connect um, with our staff because we're used to kind of having hallway conversations or collaborating in a lab or troubleshooting hands-on. And so um, we set up kind of like virtual coffee chats. We did weekly team check-ins. Um, we did kind of all hands meetings where people working on, you know, technical problems provided a forum for open dialogue and connection. And to me, um, I do think that Focusing on communication and connection in that time of uncertainty and change helps bring people together. Um, it kind of eliminates some of the rumor mill or uncertainty. And then I think um, as a leader, spending time um, with your employees and kind of understanding what some of their challenges are, you know, navigating to working from home, managing complex situations at home and having that empathy um, and kind of sharing some of the things, just be human. Um, I feel like that has been, um, you know, my biggest takeaway. It's how do you keep your workforce um, engaged, keep productivity, business goals moving forward, but being sensitive to the challenges and complexities that people are facing and then um, putting your employees' health and safety as a top priority. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, you've all mentioned thus far the, the importance of putting the employee first and em empathizing with that employee and the, the importance of building community as well. Sean, is there anything else that you wanted to add on this topic? I mean, I, my experiences would be very similar with, with um, Carl's and Lisa's. Uh, you know, I think the, the points that, you know, I would sort of reinforce have been really important for us as well, you know, are, are some of the ones that Lisa was really emphasizing in terms of communication. Um, and some of the points that, that Carl was, um, was really emphasizing, which is, you know, the leader's role is to step back and, all right, so nothing's normal anymore, figure it out, because everybody else needs guidance. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's our job to put that, you know, to make clarity where there isn't any, um, and then help people understand it. So, yeah, I mean, my, my experiences would mirror really closely what's been shared. Thank you all for, for tackling that question during these uncertain times. I want to shift gears slightly and um, move to a topic we're going to have Lisa address. Uh, and I want to talk uh, with you, Lisa, a little bit about um, your experience. Uh, you know, almost everyone in senior leadership has experienced imposter syndrome at some point in their career, right? A time when you doubted yourself and had some internal fear that you were going to be exposed as a fraud. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about a time when you've overcome this lack of confidence and what do you recommend that our audience do to develop the confidence to go for it, as you mentioned earlier, and really seize the opportunities that come your way? Yeah, um, this, is, this is a good one. This one kind of really dug deep, um, this question, but you know, I feel like I've been, I've been battling with imposter syndrome my entire career. And to be honest, I feel like I still battle with it. It's, um, it's a journey, it's a journey that I'm on, it's a journey that I'm committed to, but um, I've actually done a lot of research on, you know, the imposter syndrome, the inner critic, and um, what kind of makes me feel good, I guess, or feel better about myself is that um, se about 70% of leaders in um, senior roles kind of battle with their inner critic or imposter syndrome. So if, if you are like me, um, and kind of face these challenges in your career, you're not alone. And, um, you know, I feel like I've had many instances um, in my career, as well as my personal life, where I felt like, hey, I'm not qualified for this job. Uh, I'm not contributing in this meeting. You know, I, I'm not technically sound. Um, you know, I don't have the right capabilities to kind of be the top talent of this organization. And so, you know, I kind of reflected on four examples where I really felt like I had to dig deep and battle that imposter syndrome. And one was when I was at Shire. Um, Shire acquired a large company, Bax at Baxalta. Um, 
and people at my level in the organization, like all of our jobs were at stake. And so we had to kind of reapply for either our existing roles or a new role. Um, and so I really had to kind of dig deep and um, get out of the negative talk and really highlight my accomplishments to the organization to date, but also um, think forward um, what I could contribute um, to the new organization moving forward. And so kind of once I battled that imposter syndrome, I was able to kind of move out of um, an engineering role and step into like a, a global corporate quality compliance role. Um, the other one, I joined Acceleron in January 2019, and I think I was on, on site and in my role for about three weeks, um, and we were getting ready to uh, we actually were getting ready to file our BLA to get approval for a hemophilia drug um, and an anemia drug, sorry. And um, the um, CEO had asked me if I could present to the board of directors of the company um, on, on where, we wa where we were with inspection readiness. And so I was on the job for like two or three weeks. I didn't have a team. I didn't know anything about the company. And so um, I was really intimidated with this task. Um, and so, you know, things that I kind of have done to overcome that um, were that I educate myself. I feel like I rely on um, either technical resources or I take webinars or I read technical reports to kind of make sure that I can feel confident um, in the background information, either going into a new role or presenting um, when I may not have been in my role long enough. And then I also um, leverage my network. So you know, reach out with questions, say, hey, I'm stepping into the stretch assignment. I've never run um, an end-to-end -end tech ops organization. I need to build out a new analytical method. What are your ideas? So tapping into others who have done this and been there and use them as a sounding board. And then, um, I don't know, to overcome my imposter syndrome, I think I need some type of validation or verification. So I ask for feedback a lot. Um, so when I'm kind of nervous at presenting to the board or stepping into a new role, I, I maybe overemphasize soliciting feedback because it helps me um, feel grounded and reassured that, you know, I am capable, I'm doing okay and like just keep trucking on. Um, and to be fully honest and transparent, I, I'm still on this journey and um, I think I'm I'm learning to kind of tackle the imposter syndrome in our, or my inner critic in a different way. And so while I may have turned towards networks or feedback or resources in the past, now that I've stepped into this more senior role, like some, I have to do things differently. And um, a lot of my leadership journey now is more inward focused. So getting, getting to understand like, why is this inner critic popping up? Um, and how can I maybe silence it and um, position it to help be me, me be more successful in the path forward. So um, I wish I could say to all of you that like, you're gonna get over this imposter syndrome and, and you're gonna be great. Um, I think I'll always have this inner critic or fear, but what's important to me is that um, I hear it, I silence it, and then I um, just, really take a deep breath. I keep my hand up and, and take a seat at that table and, and just move on. And, and sometimes it's just kind of navigating and understanding yourself as a leader and tapping into those resources to overcome it. Thank you, Lisa. We really appreciate your, again, your vulnerability and your um, willingness to share with us that, that so many leaders feel this way. And um, in the interest of time, while well, I'm sure that Carl and Sean also have some additional stories to share with us on this topic, I am going to move us to the next question uh, because we do want to make sure we get to uh, questions from our audience as well. So Sean and Carl, we'll, we'll hear your imposter story, imposter syndrome stories later. Uh, so Sean, on to you. Uh, as you said, you manage 7,000 people. You're a leader in a tech company, and part of your role is to help people thrive and grow within your organization. Can you share an example or two of people who you have managed or you currently manage who have been successful in driving their own careers forward? Uh, because as we know, that's you know how this thing works. You have to push yourself forward, as Lisa was just saying. What do they do? What are their keys to success? And based on these experiences, what advice do you share with others who want to take charge of their own careers? Yeah, um, so this is a, a great question. Uh, it's a topic that uh, I like a lot. Um, uh, it's something that personally I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the last couple of decades. Um, 
and I do quite a bit of mentoring um, inside the company and outside the company. So it's a, it's a space that I'm pretty familiar with. And I have the good fortune to have, you know, um, met, spoken with, worked with, um, become acquainted with lots of different people who have had, you know, really um, significant success in their careers in, in lots of different ways. Um, some of that success is uh, measured in a level of satisfaction in the work. Some of it's measured in a, a job that they've gotten or a promotion. Um, so there's lots of different measures, but I think, you know, there's a few things that sort of um, coalesce for me in terms of what, what's the, the commonality, the pull through on, on all of those folks. And I think the first thing you mentioned it in the setup um, is manage it. No, nobody's going to do it for you. Um, you know, you may work for a very big company or a very small company and there may be no resources or great resources in terms of career development or employee development or what have you. Um, but I'm relatively certain that every company you tell that, that you work for will tell you that, you know, your employment is your responsibility. Um, and I strongly encourage people to, to take that to heart. So to make an effort to manage it. And again, one of the themes that I would sort of pull through is, you know, people that I've seen who are successful at, you know, managing their career and getting what they want out of it, actually think about it in a couple of pieces. Um, one thing that I've done for, for quite a while, and I, I see a number of others have as well, is they separate this idea of career advancement from career development. A lot of people will initially talk about, well, I want to get a promotion or I want to get that. And, and that's important, but that's an outcome. And so they tend to focus more on the things that they can take action against. Um, and, and those two things sort of work into two separate pieces. One is personal development. So what is it I can do to develop myself? And then the second is career development. What can I do to develop my career? And they're not exactly the same. Um, you know, from an individual point of view, you can look at the type of job that you might want to get, whether it's a, a certain level in an organization or if it's a certain function within an organization you want to work for. And you can do sort of an internal assessment of your own skills and capabilities and experiences. What do I have that that job needs? And by extension, what do I not have that that job needs? Or that that type of job needs or that you know level of job needs? And if you're really purposeful about that, you can really focus your personal development efforts on acquiring those skills or those experiences. And it gives you a little bit more control to know that you're making progress on that. If you do a good job of a you know, personal development plan or, you know, thinking about personal development and you start to think about career development, this idea that you might want to have a job of a different nature or of a different level, you know, then one of the things you can do is start to map out what are those things that you would like to do. I've focused very much on the nature of the work that I like rather than the type of job, but some folks are very clear on the type of job that they want. Either one is okay, you just need to have an understanding of that. And if you do that well, the third piece then is to, to start to talk in particular about your career development, but also your personal development with others, both to get input and feedback, to use them as a sounding board, but importantly, to share your aspirations, you know, to talk with others inside your company, to build that network, to say, hey, look, I think I have this set of capabilities. These are some things I'm working on. And, you know, ultimately, if I can do that, I, I think I'll be ready for that job or that job. And, and I'd, like to, I'd like to have that. Can you help me? And those first conversations will be really awkward. Uh, my first one talking to my Gary Welsh was the guy at the time. Um, and it, it was the first boss that I ever had to tell that, look, I really like you, but at some point I don't want to work for you. I actually want to go over there and do something different. And he was incredibly receptive and very kind about it. And he was very willing to help. And that was, you know, an important thing to take away again, like, you know, people are there to help, but you got to know when to ask. And I think, you know, focusing in a little bit on, you know, that idea of, of personal development and career development leading to, you know, career progression. Uh, that's one area that I think is very common in terms of, you know, people who I've seen had, you know, good success in managing their own careers. Thank you, Sean. I really appreciate um, how you've taken us through several examples that can really indicate how people can drive their own careers and how you've seen people be successful at your organization and you've been successful. Uh, and again, in the interest of time, because I know our audience has um, some questions, we want to make sure we have some time to answer. Um, we are going to jump into the um, open questions with, with the uh, attendees. So if you have an open question, you can type it into the Q&A box. And we already have an open question, so I'll get started with that in just a minute. Uh, and uh, I'll pose the question, and then um, Carl, Lisa, Sean, whoever feels compelled to, to take a stab, we'd love to hear your thoughts. 
So the first question to come come through, um, which is I think always an interesting question, is um, uh, it seems like companies want to hire round pegs to fit round holes, meaning they are increasingly looking for people who have the experience to do the job they need to fill. Can one of you speak to how you can convince a hiring manager at your company or another company that you are going to be successful in a role that is different from the role that you currently hold, especially given that you might be competing with people with more experience than you for that position? So I'm not going to regurgitate anything I just said um, previously, but but one thing that because I, I think all of that actually can help you know can help fit this, particularly if it's an internal situation. Um, networking outside the company helps all those things work outside the company. But but I think the one piece that I'd add here is, um, and it, this applies for me anyway, and I think for a lot of others, if you think about it, it applies at many levels. So entry level positions in an organization as well as more senior levels. There is this idea of a transferable skill set. And, you know, one of the, I just recently had a conversation with an industrial engineer who was really worried about being able to get a job in, in biotech. And he was concerned that the specific degree that he had wasn't a biotech degree or wasn't a chemical engineering degree. And, you know, what I shared was there's a way to sort of position that um, differently, which is, you know, an engineer has, irrespective of the specific field, has been taught how to solve problems. That's, that's our job. Like we know how to characterize a problem. We know how to solve a problem. We know how to prepare that package and move on. And this idea of a transferable skill set as being um, an important consideration for any role that you want to take on, I think is important because there are going to be roles where you don't have certain qualifications or certain specifications. Um, but there are a number of experiences that I'm sure you've had, even if it's an academic sense, that if you think about what the role actually needs and you think about what you actually have, from that skills and capabilities and experiences point of view, I think you could paint the picture a little bit differently. And you know that for me is a really important consideration when hiring for any position um, at any level. And if you have the advantage of applying for a position that's internal, one of the things that you can do to you know sort of better inform that conversation as well is understand what's the capability set of the team that you'd be joining and what's the complement that you can provide to that. Because that's a really important dynamic as well in you know, and that, that applies in, in technical spaces as well as general management spaces where you're looking to balance the, the skill set of the team. So that, that's something to think about as well in terms of how to position yourself and, and your suitability for a given role. Thanks, Sean. I always like when people mention transfer versus, transferable skills. It's an important keyword. Uh, Carl or Lisa, do you have any quick uh, additional advice to add before we move to the next question? No, I actually love what Sean said. And, and the only thing I would, I would add is that, you know, as, as someone who, who's applying for something, what you need to do is to help convince the person who's making the decision that you have something to offer that maybe they didn't see, maybe they didn't, they didn't appreciate. So it's, it's educating them. Don't assume that everyone knows what you know. Uh, you have to educate them on what you think you have to bring and what you think will make a big difference in this particular job. So um, you have to kind of sell that and explain that rationale. And it's not really just about qualifications. I don't think most managers worry so much about what the qualifications say. They're looking for the best person, the person who's going to deliver the most success or the person who's going to bring some more value to the company than, than um, other, uh, other people might. And so um, you have to just be able to make that case. Why are you the one, why do you think you're the one who can bring the most value to the company? Thank you, Carl. Yes, it's always important that you're ready to market yourself and, and tell mm -hmm. your future employer why you're the right person for the job. Well, here's another uh, very focused, how do I advance my career in tech kind of question. Um, this uh, attendee asks, uh, how, when I want to transition from an individual contributor to an engineering management role, what are some of the most important considerations to make? Such a transition is a confluence of many factors, such as personal interest, available opportunity, formal training, such as the MSEM, mentorship, business growth, et cetera. And should one already be performing at a leadership level to make this transition? Um, how could an uh, MSEM help? I think it's a great question. And I certainly can remember going through a similar kind of set of questions myself. The first thing that I would say is if any person who's wanting to transition from being an individual contributor to a leader, you have to know thyself. You have to understand who you are, understand um, what it is to lead yourself, because you really can't hope to lead others until you can lead yourself. And so um, once you feel comfortable enough to do that, then you can figure out how to take your style. There's no one right answer. Everyone's got a different style and everyone's got a different way of doing it. And 
you do have to be flexible enough to meet people where they are. But in the end, if you are able to kind of learn and understand how to motivate and how to get people to see maybe what they can't see on their own or to help them to aspire for uh, something that they're not yet today maybe aspiring for, that's when you're actually leading. Um, and so I'd say, you know, it, it, it's a bit about understanding that you, what you want to accomplish. And then like you, like the questioner asked, um, you definitely are going to need to make sure you have the right set of skills, um, which could include an MSCM in order to make sure that you're prepared to, to do that leadership. Yes, Sarah, I'd like to add one thing. Um, sure. You know, I think transitioning from an individual contributor to a people manager, like Carl said, is a lot about um, understanding yourself and understanding like who you are as a leader. But um, you are also like the voice of a group or voice of a uh, line function as a people manager when you transition from an individual contributor to a manager. And um, one of the things that I found extremely valuable that the MSCM offered was um, it completely bolstered my business acumen skills. So I was always strong technically, um, and I definitely got um, the leadership skills and the ability to self-develop um, from the MSEM program, but um, understanding finance, business, the strategy was, it was allowed me to really be an advocate and a voice for my um, functional areas. I transitioned to a people manager, so making sure that we got the right resources, we get the right CapEx funding, um, when there was a, a, a technical issue, how to really articulate that challenge um, in a manner that kind of resonated with senior executives. And so I feel like a lot of the fundamental business acumen and strategy skills that complemented my already, you know, fostered technical skills really set me apart from my peers um, as, as a people manager. And so um, that's kind of my vote for the MSCM. Yeah, it's a compliment to what you're learning on the job. You're going to build some additional higher level business skills as well. Okay, I have another good question that's come in. There's so many good ones. It's hard to know what to pick. Um, but this one, this person says, I'd love to hear from someone on the panel who's experienced working for a director or an executive who is difficult to work under. Perhaps they're not receptive to ideas, they're difficult to communicate with, or they're not easy to approach for feedback and discussion as you would like. How did this hinder your relationship and how did you work to overcome the challenges? And I'm sure none of you have ever experienced this before. Yeah, this, this is a hypothetical question, right? <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I'll offer a thought here. Sure, I mean, at different times, it's actually interesting. I stopped counting, but I've had like 19 bosses in 28 years or something. So um, I've had the opportunity to work for um, some really fabulous people, um, some people that I still am, am very close with personally. Um, and there are some some folks that I don't, you know, I haven't really talked to them since I stopped working for them. Um, and, and that's okay. I mean, like, look, at the end of the day, um, not every relationship is 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 going to be one that results in, in a friendship. Um, but ultimately, if you've got, you know, a, circum a set of circumstances with a manager that are challenging, I think, you know, it's important just to make sure that there's a really clear focus on what actually needs to be had from the relationship. You know, it's important to understand that not everybody's going to be wired exactly the way I am, you know, and sometimes, you know, there's, a, there's, there are situations where I'm going to need to adapt, you know, in order for me to deliver the value to the, you know, to the team or to the company that, you know, that I need to deliver, I'm going to have to adjust how I, how I, how I engage and how I interact. And, you know, part of my responsibility as an employee is to make basically all the relationships that I have effective, you know, and there are different personalities that are in the mix. Um, and, you know, not everybody thinks and, and acts and walks just like me. And, and that's a reality. And, you know, so my, my most challenging managerial relationship was one where, you know, this person just wasn't really interested in listening. You know, they weren't really overly interested in my opinion. And while that was frustrating on some level, I, I did, you know, understand how that circumstance was going to play out. I did find some ways to deal with it more effectively in terms of being able to get my points across. You know, and one thing that I realized was, this person liked to get ideas and feedback, not in meetings with other people. So I kept going at it and I kept, you know, sort of trying to figure out how, how can I, you know, can I get through this? And, and ultimately what I found was there was more, you know, more ways to look at a common problem and I made the best of it. So, you know, it was challenging for a while, but, but ultimately it worked out and we, we got on a, on a pretty steady plane. So 
yeah, I don't know. There's no perfect answer there, I suppose. Uh, thank you, Sean, um, for your response. Do, do either of you have another, any other angle you want to add to this question? You know, I, I really love what Sean said. And, and one thing in particular I, I just kind of underline is, you know, trying to figure out if the difficult relationship or if the difficult uh, manager is, is someone that you're going to write off and say, look, I just, this person and I just don't work well together or they're not interested in working with me. That's one answer. But oftentimes I've seen in, in some past experiences where I had, a, had, some, had some managers that I didn't think I could work with or I didn't understand them or they would frustrate the hell out of me. I think I actually learned that they just had a different way of thinking and that I had to figure out how to reach them in the ways that, that worked. Um, and it turned out actually to be quite a, a benefit to me. So it was an opportunity that I was about to miss because I was more concerned about the individual and instead I learned through them. And so as Sean was saying, you know, trying to figure out what's, what, you know, kind of how do they receive information? How do they, how are they influenced? Or, you know, um, I actually had a boss with that I never felt I could please. I just, everything I did, it was wrong. And, um, and basically my whole mission became, how do I anticipate what he's gonna ask me? I'm gonna really, and I actually got good at it. By the time I, uh, the, our time together was over, I could anticipate what he was gonna ask and I was ready. And so, it, and, and that helped me because I could use that in, in many, many other instances. Thank you very much, Carl. Okay, um, there are so many good questions. I, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end on one that's a favorite to mine, but we're gonna have to keep it pretty brief because we also wanna have a chance at the end to have each of you give us some final, final um, remarks, brief final remarks. So this is just, a, 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 the topic is networking. It's challenging for many, even when the importance is understood. You know, particularly now in these times where you can't invite someone to go have a cup of coffee. Um, how do you pr approach conversations with existing or new connections in a way that is comfortable? And ha how has this evolved over the course of your career? And maybe to keep this brief, if you guys could just each give your top networking tip, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up in that way before we move to final remarks. Lisa, would you mind starting? Sure. Um... I recognize that you know reaching out for mentoring or networking is awkward, but um, you know be personable, um, be genuine in your request, and I'd say um, you know send an email um, and and just go for it. Yeah, Thanks, I mean, Lisa. A, a, a quick one for me would be you know a little bit like Lisa, just stay in touch. You know, and actually one thing that is a really effective tool for that is LinkedIn. Um, building that network, pay attention to what's going on. It's easy to give somebody a thumbs up or to drop them a note. If you stay in touch by phone, it's easy to drop them a text and just say, hey, look, hope everything's going well. Um, so you, you sort of have to keep it in mind. I think that's that's one of the things. It's don't forget about it. And once it becomes habitual, um, it's just something that you can stay, you know, you can stay on, on top of. Yeah, Thanks, I, would John. Say, I would say also just be curious. You know, if you're, if you're curious about how people are, um, you know, that'll, that'll um, I think, animate your connectivity and asking, you know, uh, them, you know, wh what's going on or asking um, a bit of their take on, on things that are happening in the world. Thank you all. Um, I'm constantly encouraging our students to get out there and, and make themselves vulnerable by meeting people. So I appreciate your willingness to share your top tips. So as you know, we're wrapping this up by 6, 6 p.m. tonight. So I want to give you each a final moment to share your top career advice. Perhaps there's something, some nugget that you haven't had a chance to say tonight that would benefit our attendees. And we'd, I'd love to hear from each of you uh, what, that, what that piece is, what you'd like to share. I, I can kick it off. Um, Thanks, you know, Lisa. My, my quick advice or my guidance to all of you is that you own um, your career journey and your career development. And so I recognize we're kind of in the midst of a pandemic or you've got other responsibilities or your work schedule is extremely demanding, but there's never a good time. And so um, my recommendation is prioritize, own it, and don't be afraid. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I'd, I'd have I'd similar, you know, sort of brevity to it. Um, I think for me, you know, three things that I would, I'd leave, I'd leave folks to think about. Uh, first, learn continuously. There's, there's always something more to know. Um, oftentimes it's about yourself. So don't think it's only in a textbook, um, but learn continuously, care deeply. You're going to spend a lot of time working. You really got to like what you do. Um, 
And if you find out that you genuinely don't like it and not just that you have a bad day, but if you really don't like your work, um, find something you do like because you're going to do it for a while. Um, and then the last thing, very similar with Lisa, um, move forward fearlessly. You know, um, you're going to make a mistake, learn from it and keep going. Thank you, Sean. Carl. Yeah, I, I think, you know, both Lisa and Sean have both, uh, you know, really done a, a fantastic job of explaining, you know, what it means to, to be in charge of your career and, and the sorts of advice they give. As someone who's been on this journey, I, anyone who's, who's earlier in the journey should listen uh, very carefully to what they just said. Um, I, I would just underline the, the whole orientation of a learning orientation as being critical and also having a, a really strong work ethic. Um, you know, and, and it's not even just about hard work. Hard work, many people work hard, but not everyone's hard work pays off. And so there are two questions I ask myself every day. Um, the first one is, am I focused on the right things? And if I can answer that question sufficiently, then I move on to the second question, which is, am I doing the right things well? And so if I can answer both those questions correctly or affirmatively each day, then I know I'm in a, in a good space. Thank you, Carl. Wow, we've received a tremendous amount of, of really excellent advice this evening from each of you. My, my to-do list of what I need to now go and do to push my own career forward is long. Uh, and we're so grateful for your expertise and your valuable insight and your uh, vulnerability and empathy with us on the phone tonight. Uh, thank you all, Carl, Lisa, and Sean for sharing your experiences. Kevin, did you wanna add any final words? Yeah, I, 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 just want, you know, I am so humbled by listening to all three of you. And I'm reminded of something that's very special uh, for me, uh, having just come back to Tufts recently. So I grew up in engineering as well, and just recently came back to, to be at the Gordon Institute and inspire the next generation of students. And I realized listening to all of your stories, uh, how special it is to have the opportunity to work with students just like you were 20, 30 years ago when you started today. Because I think the Gordon's special in the sense that we, yes, we are teaching you the business context that Lisa referred to, the strategy, the leadership piece, understanding yourself, understanding others, but it's in the context of technology. And being part of the School of Engineering at Tufts allows us to have the platform to enable a whole new generation of leaders who are technically strong, that's the starting point, but now have all the additional context to become that true transformative leader and the with heart piece was so clear in all of you today. So thank you very much for being so open and sharing. Uh, you were certainly inspiring to me. I hope, and I think looking at the Q&A, you were inspiring to others as well. So I really appreciate it. And to all of you on the call today, I hope that if this triggered a curiosity about how you can take control of your career and do that improvement, that we would welcome any conversations at the Gordon to see if there's any way that we can help you and we can welcome you back to our community at Tufts. So thank you very much for taking all the time to join us this evening. And we hope this is a down payment on future conversations. <laughs>